Welcome everyone. We will start uh, with our amazing uh, supporter, Rob Johnson. Uh, Rob uh, will talk a little bit, make an introduction for us, and I will make a brief uh, introduction of Rob Johnson for who does not know him. Uh, Rob Johnson is the president of the Institute for New Economic Thinking, INET, which he co-founded with George Soros, William Janeway, and James Baldwin in 2009. From the outset, the founders envisioned INET as a globally engaged network that could lead the evolution of economic thought toward the interests of people and the planet. Please, Rob, thank you for joining us again, for supporting us in this initiative, and the floor is yours. You can now uh, make your initial commentaries. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, uh, Mariana, and uh, I want to welcome our speakers here today. Uh, I'll let you introduce them in a few moments as they, each of them speaks, but they're each, how do I say, extraordinarily well-suited to the challenge that Pope Francis has given to us with his question, what place does the current economic system give to uselessness, that is, to beauty? Now, I never really, I got my head stirred a little bit because I never thought beauty and uselessness uh, were somehow mutually exclusive or what have you. And uh, I, uh, somebody just from my house started printing. <laughs> oh, well, uh, sorry if, if there was background noise. But, uh, but I, I think that we are in a very, very difficult time I gave a talk last night in New York and I cited Marvin Gaye, who begins his famous song, What's Going On, by saying, we've got to bring some love in here today. Yeah. And he speaks of that in the first two stanzas, but in the third, he says, we've got to bring some understanding here today. But what I found very, very profound, and I grew up in Detroit, so I'm a Marvin Gaye fan, but is that he starts with love and then goes to understanding. Once we've healed the divisions and regained trust, we can explore together for the common good. But in the turmoil that we are experiencing right now, there is a great deal of, of tension. And Mary Evelyn is a Confucian scholar. I've been very involved in China and seeing the US-China split seeing the Pope's concern about many things has moved me a great deal. And I'll cite to you all, there's a website called China Heritage run by a man named Barme, and he's got a tribute called the Invisible Republic of the Spirit. In the Invisible Republic of the Spirit, which was written by a man named Stefan Zweig in a biography of Roman Roland, who was very concerned at a similarly turbulent time between the world wars and on the cusp of World War II. Uh, it, he continued to, what I'll say, play a leadership role. But his biographer, Zweig said, the invisible Republic of the spirit, the universal fatherland has been established among the races and among the nations. Its frontiers are open to all who dwell therein its only law is that of brotherhood. These are old days, brother and sisterhood now. Its only enemies are hatred and arrogance between nations. Whoever makes his home with this invisible realm becomes a citizen of the world. He is an heir, not of one people, but of all peoples. Henceforth, he is an indweller in all his tongues and in all countries, in the universal past and the universal future. What concerns me in this turbulent time is that we, to bring some love in here today, we need artistic language. Literal scientific rituals are like armor. C.G. Jung wrote a great deal late in his life after his feeling culpable for misunderstanding the extent of what would, uh, what you might call blossom in Nazi Germany. And in his, uh, I guess it was his 10th volume of his collected works, he wrote called Civilization in Transition. 
And he talked a great deal about the unconscious self and the unconscious collective and all the ways in which we deceive ourselves. We create what he called shadows. There's an artist in 1945 named Robin George Collingwood. He wrote a book called The Principles of Art. And I'll conclude before handing it to all of you who are going to explore beauty, a comment that he made that I think is quite germane to the challenge we face today. The artist must prophesize, not in the sense that he foretells things to come, but in the sense that he tells his audience at the risk of their displeasure, the secrets of their own hearts. His business as an artist is to speak out, to make a clean breast, but what he has to utter is not as individualistic theory of art would have us think, his own secrets. As spokesperson of his community, the secrets he must utter are theirs. The reason why they need him is that no community altogether knows its own heart. And by failing in this knowledge, a community deceives itself on the one subject concerning which ignorance means death. For the evils which come from that ignorance, the poet as prophet suggests no remedy because he's already given one. The remedy is the poem itself. Art is the community's medicine for the worst disease of mind, the corruption of consciousness. I think that Pope Francis is a beacon moving us towards that invisible republic of the spirit, appealing to beauty, appealing to arts in the very elliptical way, but I look forward to your exploration because I think that this is the pathway towards bringing some love and bringing some understanding here today. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Thank you for this amazing introduction. Uh, before I invite our speakers, I would like just to make a summary. Uh, why are we here? Um, and uh, for who does not, does not know, during the Young Scholars Initiative in 2020, in the beginning of the pandemic, uh, a partnership between the INET, the Institute for New Economic Thinking, and Scholars Ocurrentes uh, made possible the intervention of His Holiness Pope Francis, uh, who proposed to the Young Scholars uh, three economic questions. Uh, YSI members, the Young Scholars Initiative members, together with the Economy of Francesco members, uh, deeply inspired by those questions, decided to organize a series of uh, webinars to discuss each one of these questions. Today, uh, we are here to discuss the third question of Pope Francis, and I would like to remind you about this third question. Uh, Pope Francis ask, asks us, what place does the current economic system give to uselessness that is to beauty? Now, uh, to start with our speakers, I would like to invite uh, Professor Mary Evelyn Tucker. I will be, make a brief introduction of her. Uh, she is the co-founder and co-director of the Forum on Religion and Ecology at the Yale University, together with her husband, John Ellen Green. Uh, Professor Tucker teaches in the Joint Master Program in Religion and Ecology at Yale between the School of the Environment and Divinity School. She also has an appointment at Yale's Department of Religion Studies, and she has authored and edited close to 20 volumes as has published hundreds of articles. She is pioneer in the field of religion and ecology. Thank you very much, Professor Tucker, for coming. I would like to open the floor for you now. Thank you so much, Mariana and Rob and all the organizers of this series. I'm delighted to know about this work. I did a little Googling and searching and uh, learned a great deal. And I'm very, very happy to be uh, together with a colleague, John Fullerton, and a new colleague, Dor Doris Summer. I admire their work enormously. So I wrote something um, as I was thinking about this, and that's what I'm going to share with you. Because I just spent a week up on the Long Island Sound on a point out into the sound where you could see the water and the sky in three directions. It was so magnificent. And I want to use this 
as a grounding for discussing beauty. So everything here on this place, this point is beautiful. Water and sky, rocks and stones, roses and hydrangeas, egrets and osprey, beaches with nesting plovers protected by humans, bird song and wave song. How can one measure this beauty? How can one capture the sounds, the smell of salt water, the clarity of the air? How can one convey the beauty of sunrise and sunset? The full moon rising in the southeast over calm water. How can one ever measure such beauty or value it in the market? This is a beauty beyond naming fully or even depicting in painting or poetry. Turner's paintings of the sea or Monet's impressions of water lilies come close, but without doubt, we can acknowledge there is a grandeur here, along with a simplicity that eludes full description. It's the spirit that Rob spoke about that's calling us. And why is that? Didn't the romantic poets try to imagine that feeling of the sublime for Wordsworth, a presence moving through things? For Keats, a thing of beauty is a joy forever. For Shelley, love and beauty and delight. There is no doubt, no change. For Blake, everything is beautiful in its own way. What then is this presence within things that calls us to be present to sunrise and sunset, to climb mountains, sit by a lake, swim in a stream? The beauty of nature calls to each of us, whether city dwellers or country dwellers. Why? because we arose out of these incredible processes and are intimately connected to them. The processes of nature have shaped us, formed our bodies and minds, infused our soul with inspiration and joy. From the great flaring forth at the beginning of time to the arising of the first atoms and molecules to the first cells four billion years ago, and multicellular life two billion years ago, to plants, to animals, to humans. This is a long journey out of which we are birthed. We are just becoming aware of the 14 billion year unfolding of our lives and future lives. The map is being drawn ever since Darwin's book arose 150 years ago, Origin of Species. Human consciousness is only beginning to become aware that we have come out of 9 billion years of universe evolution and 4.6 billion years of Earth's evolution. This is indeed a sacred universe. We are late in the story as hominids, Homo erectus 1.5 million years ago, but Homo sapiens only 200,000 years ago. We're still trying to earn our last name as wisdom keepers, as sentient beings, beauty loving homo sapiens. Our sentience is aligned with that of the more than human world, plants and animals. Our community building is similar to that of the forest world, roots communicating and protecting life. So our question is, can we listen to plants? Can we understand or stand under trees to witness the exchange of life-giving processes as you are doing in the economy of Francesco? What form of economics would this become? To dwell in our home is the meaning of economics. To live in the face of mystery and the unknown, to bow to beauty and say, this is what I value. This is what I will protect. This is what future generations deserve to inherit. This is the path forward toward a future that is not simply sustainable, but flourishing. For there is no genuine future without seeds and soil, flowers and grasses, vegetables and fruits, rivers and lakes, trees and forests. Is this not the great community of life that surrounds us? feeds us in body and soul, nurtures us in mind and spirit. Without it, 
We are simply homo economicus with eyes only on markets and profit. With beauty, we are filled with possibility of creativity that gives birth to music and song, dance and drama and art. So the question before us is, what is the intrinsic value of beauty, not utilitarian? Dostoevsky said, beauty will save the world. But Solzhenitsyn said, he asked, who will save beauty? It is up to us, the time is now. Let us plant the seeds and gather the flowers today and all the days of our life. And it is emerging because we have regenerative capitalism, regenerative economics, regenerative business and the work that John is doing and others. We have new education, regenerative education in what Doris is doing. We have regenerative agriculture. We have regenerative medicine, planetary health. These are fields that are pointing us in this direction. So let me conclude with a passage from Thomas Berry, my teacher who passed away in 2009 and a thousand people honored him at a memorial in New York. This is from his book called Evening Thoughts. And he says, because he was the one who said, we need a new story of this journey of the universe, a life story that will inspire the transformation of our time. And he says, this was in 2000 at uh, a meeting at the UN in New York. He says, tonight, as we look up at the evening sky with the stars emerging against the fading background of the sunset, we think of the mythic foundations of our future we need to engage in a shared dream experience. The experiences that we have spoken of as we look up at the starry sky at night and as in the morning, we see the landscape revealed as the sun dawns over the earth. These experiences reveal a physical world, but also a more profound world that cannot be bought with money, cannot be manufactured with technology cannot be listed on the stock market, cannot be made in the chemical laboratory, cannot be reproduced with all our genetic engineering, cannot be sent by email or social media. These experiences require only that we follow the deepest feelings of the human soul. What we look for is no longer the Pax Romana, the peace of Imperial Rome, nor is it simply the Pax Humana, the peace among humans, but the Pax Gaia, the peace of earth and every being on the earth. This is the original and final peace, the peace granted by whatever power it is that brings our world into being. Within the universe, the planet earth, with all its wonder, is the place for the meeting of the divine and human. And that is what Pope Francis calls us to in Laudato C as well. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Professor Tucker. I'm very touched for this word. I, I think I say for everybody, I speak for everybody now. Uh, thanks for remember us. One thing that Paul Francis always say that everything is connected. So this beauty that comes from this connection of the human being with the nature, with our common home, uh, it's where the beauty is. Thank you for remember uh, this, this important part of uh, what we are doing here. Uh, well, now uh, I would like to invite uh, Professor Dori Sommer. Uh, I will also make a brief uh, presentation. Uh, she's the director of the Cultural Agencies Initiative at Harvard University and Ira and Jewel Williams Professor of Romance, Languages and Literatures and also of African and African American Studies. Uh, her academic and outreach work promotes development through arts and humanities, especially through pretests in Boston public schools throughout Latin America and beyond. Uh, she also has a BA from New Jersey's Douglas College for Women and a PhD for Rogers University. I don't know if I uh, say it right. 
thank you, Doris, uh, for, for joining us today. And the floor is your, yours now. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, Doris, if you can uh, unmute your microphone. I'm sorry. Okay, thank, uh, thank you. you. I'll, I'll repeat my uh, very sincere thanks for this invitation, for the opportunity to talk uh, in an interdisciplinary setting about beauty. Uh, I want to follow Professor Tucker's uh, words and also Professor Johnson uh, to see that the Pope is including what looks useless as a major theme along with uh, economics and politics is a measure of his creativity and, um, and acuity. Because if we need change in the world, change is made by uh, shifting paradigms. And people who know how to shift paradigms are called artists, whether they're engineers or politicians or business people. Uh, when Friedrich Schiller says uh, during the French Revolution that the only way uh, humanly to respond to violence is through creativity so that one avoids more violence, one doesn't get into the spiral. He's counting on each of us to exercise what he calls um, the drive to be creative, <clears throat> to be creative uh, and uh, surprising. And he calls that, he coins a word in German, he calls it the Spieltrieb, the drive to be playful and creative. And that word stuck in German, and I want to appropriate it for English. I think the play drive is um, a faculty that, uh, that we all can cultivate. Uh, and it has to do with the appreciation that Professor Tucker talked about, and also about the work of the artist that I would like to add. Uh, what, what is beauty for a humanist? It's the ability to think in disinterested ways, because if something is useless, we evaluate it, not because it will make us rich or famous or smart, uh, but because it's worth thinking about simply for the pleasure of it. And that's why Immanuel Kant wrote an entire critique on aesthetic judgment, not because he was particularly interested in aesthetics, but he was interested in free judgment. How does one become an enlightened subject without developing that faculty? Standing back, not having any uh, particular economic or intellectual or social or even moral uh, interest in what one is thinking about, but simply allowing beauty to distract us enough to want to think about something and to think with other people. And this is, this is the political beauty of, um, of Kant's aesthetics. And I'm reading him through Hannah Arendt. Because uh, beauty stops us and surprises us and engages us without interest, we don't know how to think about it. We're floating. And he says that is the condition of the modern subject. We're not sure about new laws that we'll have to legislate new economic policies, new tastes that will develop. We don't know, we float for a while. And because we're floating, there are no preconceived concepts. We're free and lost, and therefore we have to talk to other people. Aesthetics is the basis of free sociability for Kant. If we don't have sociability, how do we think about collaboration, about democracy, about loving people? So this is the charm of Kant's aesthetics. It seems useless, and precisely because of that, it can ignite faculties that we have not developed, the faculty of disinterest and of sociability across classes, across genders, across races, because none of us has a, a particular economic or, <clears throat> or social or moral interest in a flower in the sky that, <clears throat> that uh, Professor Tucker described, but it stops us and we wanna think about it together. Okay, that's, that's Kant's third critique. So Arendt says, look, uh, I wrote a book on Kant's political philosophy and all of us know that he never wrote one. It would have been dangerous 
for a liberal to write in uh, the German monarchy. So he wasn't stupid. He didn't want to end his life in jail. Instead of writing a political philosophy, he wrote the aesthetics, which does the work of politics. All right, now, uh, everything else I want to say uh, is just a footnote on uh, Kantian aesthetics, but it does the work of politics. It levels the playing ground. It makes us want to talk to each other, want to learn from each other, uh, want to construct a concept together that will make sense of our shared experience. The experience comes first, the theory comes later. If we start with concepts, we're already trapped. If we start with surprise, we're open. And that's what beauty does. That's what the useless does. So let me, let me just say um, a couple of uh, words about this. Uh, one of Kant's uh, great uh, disciples, I already mentioned, Friedrich Schiller, uh, always a revolutionary. And then when he saw the, the French Revolution become a terror, his heart was broken. And that's when he sat down to write what, what response to the terror? Letters on the aesthetic education of man. And he says, I bet you don't think this is urgent. He said, it is. Because if you continue to respond to terror in conventional ways, you just spiral down the way that Foucault warned us. You should uh, respond to terror with so charming a surprise that your enemy will stop and say, what was that? And want to talk to you. Art is the bulwark against uh, what he called savagery on one side, where you don't want to think, and barbarism on the other, where you think you're so smart you don't have to listen to other people, where reason is the only trap. So barbarism is uh, a trap on the other side of savagery. You have to be in the middle, flexible, allow yourself to be surprised and to listen. Another um, disciple, we're all disciples of Kant in, uh, in the world of uh, humanities, but another disciple I want to feature um, is, Friedrich, is um, um, Viktor Shklovsky, a Russian formalist. Uh, in 1917, what was he doing? <laughs> he was writing an essay that everyone in, in our field has seen. It's called uh, Art as Technique. I like the Spanish translation, Art as Artifice, because it lays out exactly that art is man made. And it's man made for the purpose of surprising, jolting. Um, and, um, and I think that, uh, that that theme already came up uh, with uh, Professor Johnson's uh, comments. Uh, it, art irritates, it makes you rethink things. How are we going to change paradigms if we don't allow ourselves uh, to be jolted? And what Shklovsky said is uh, wonderful because he says, you get jolted out of habit. When the world becomes habitual, how much can you intervene in? How much do you care about? You listen to news about the war in Ukraine and the first uh, news is devastating. The second one is predictable. The third one, you already know and you don't care intensely anymore. It's art that can refresh your perception, make the perception difficult, this is, this is the charm of Shklovsky's article. He says, art is not about making communication easy. It's about making communication difficult. So you have to stop and think about it and ask people. And so uh, the difficulty revives your investment in the world. It makes you care about the world. And, I, and uh, sometimes I prefer Spanish, sometimes I prefer English. I love the verb in English to care, to care for. It means both to love and to be responsible. So with Shklovsky's short 10 page article, I can circulate it, you can find it. Uh, you get the message that aesthetics is about caring for the world because it makes the world a challenge. All right, so I, I don't know how much time I have. I wrote more notes for myself. Uh, but I, maybe I can just say that with these theories, cultural agents makes the, um, the work practical by actually learning from artists about practical protocols. We can th think theoretically and write uh, interesting books 
uh, for each other, <laughs> but how do we make these um, innovations land in practical programs? Well, we follow protocols the way artists do. An artist doesn't just think about ideas, an artist lands. Uh, so the person who made Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed a practical um, contribution is the theater artist, Augusto Bois, who wrote Theater of the Oppressed. He said, and, and then he got elected, talk about uh, the, the political effect of this, he got elected uh, councilman to Rio de Janeiro, only one of 130 councilmen, but he, he uh, recruited two uh, good lawyers, went to the street and did theater of the oppressed, which means find a group that's having a problem, get them to stage that problem as a tragedy. And then everyone else on the street intervenes as spect actors. There are no spectators in the world. We're spect actors. We take responsibility. So each one of us spect actors figures out a way out of the tragedy, gets on stage, changes the script, sees that that works, sits down, another person comes in, tries another thing. It's workshopping ideas in, on the ground. And Bois, with this artistic practice based on Freire's pedagogy, uh, got 13 laws passed. Six of them were passed at the national level. And one that I remember, I can look up more, one is, um, is defense of uh, victims, uh, of uh, witnesses of violent crimes. That was not a law in Brazil before. So it's this kind of artistic practice that can generate entire communities to co-create. Uh, without participatory arts, it's very hard to ground good ideas like love, like co-creation, like um, shared budgeting. <laughs> when you make things into participatory arts practices, uh, we have a chance to make good on good ideas. Uh, I'll end there. I'm so grateful to Professor Tucker for mentioning uh, the pretext protocol because that's the version of a classroom teacher who learns from Boal, from Freire, from Jacques Rancière, who's not a minor uh, political theorist, who featured the ignorant schoolmaster as the way forward. Don't bring people towards emancipation. Simply recognize that everyone is emancipated, that children know how to ask questions, how to play, and how to work out problems with each other. Okay, if you bring people there, you're still in the lead. So um, this version of, uh, of uh, collaborative and um, adaptive leadership uh, is written very boldly into Rancière's book on pedagogy. I'll, I'll just stop there and, um, and look forward to conversations with you. I, I wanna hear other people now. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor Salmer. Uh, thanks for uh, highlighting that art and beauty as an important instrument of uh, co-creation, collaboration, critical thinking, caring. Uh, I think that this is very important for us, uh, that we are trying to build a new economy, an economy with soul, as Pope Francis uh, also asked us. I also like to thank you for sitting Paulo Freire that uh, we Brazilians are very proud of. <laughs> And now I'd like to follow with uh, dear uh, John Fullerton. Uh, I will also make a brief uh, um, presentation. He's an unconventional economist, impact investor, writer, and some have said, have said philosopher. Building on and integrating the work of many, he's the architect of regenerative economics, first conceived in his uh, 2015 booklet. Regenerative capitalism, how universal patterns and principles will shape the new economy. After a successful 20 year career on Wall Street, where he was managing director of what he calls the old GP Morgan, John founded the Capital Institute in 2010, where his work reflects the rising evolutionary shift in consciousness for, from modern age thinking to integral age thinking. 
The Capital Institute is dedicated to the bold reimagination of economics and finance in service to life, guided by the universal patterns and principles that describe how all healthy living systems that sustain themselves in the real world actually work. The promise of regenerative economics and finance is to unlock the profound and presently unseen potential that is the source of our future prosperity and the reason for hope in our troubled times. Thank you very much, uh, Fulito, for coming, for joining us today. The floor is yours now. <clears throat> Thank you, Mariana. Um, I guess I didn't send you the short bio. I apologize. For that. <laughs> um, first of all, it's 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 a, a true privilege to be participating today. I want to thank you, Rob, um, uh, for inviting me. And uh, boy, two uh, two uh, wonderful sharings by uh, two two professors that I um, would love to spend time in your classes. Um, I, I'm not a professor. I'm a I'm a um, uh, I'm a former banker, and um, uh, Doris, the, the the phrase you used about being freed and lost um, explains nicely the decade between when I left J.P. Morgan and when I founded Capital Institute. Um, so, so I, I suppose I am a uh, budding artist um, uh, that that spent ten years free and lost, uh, and in many ways uh, still like all of us, I think a bit lost. Um, but what I'd like to share um, is a, uh, a few reflections on the, the thinking that I've been developing. Um, and um, uh, I'm just pulling up some notes here, sorry. Um, and, and of course, this question is, is obviously meant to be provocative. It certainly stops you in your tracks. It's uncomfortable uh, in that sense. It's a, a creative question. And the first thing um, uh, that I have to say, and this probably doesn't even need to be said, is that there is no place for usefulness and beauty in our current economic system. And I would challenge you to even find the word beauty in an economics textbook. Uh, and the second thing that came up for me as I reflected on the question is a beautiful turn of phrase that Wendell Berry wrote. Wendell Berry is unrelated to my knowledge uh, to Thomas Berry that Mary Evelyn spoke of, but um, he's, a, he's a, a brilliant poet and man of letters and agrarian philosopher. Um, and he said, there are no unsacred places. There are only sacred places and desecrated places. So how have we come to this place where most of humanity innately values beauty of all kinds and yet the dominant operating system that governs our lives, I would argue, our economic system, is devoid of even any reference to beauty. And I think the answer to that question is willful ignorance rooted in a worldview, and, and both Mary Evelyn and Doris have spoken about paradigms. Um, I, as I said, I, I think we have willful ignorance rooted in a worldview, that is how we think, how we see the world, which in turn has trapped us in an addiction. Let me explain a little bit what I mean. The worldview is mechanism. Uh, we, the, 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 the assumption is we live in a clockwork universe as discovered by Isaac Newton. We are um, uh, obsessed with Cartesian logic, the reductionism, the reductionist method of the scientific uh, of, of our scientific process for figuring out what's complicated. And of course, the scientific revolution has brought us great progress. But as Wes Jackson has warned us, uh, there is nothing wrong with the reductionist method so long as we don't confuse the method for how the world actually works. And it turns out there's a vast difference between what is complicated, such as putting, the man, putting a man on the moon or a cell phone and what is complex, such as our living planet, a forest, a human being, or the global economy. What is not well known, and this is part of the research I've done after I uh, went in my search for um, you know, a possible solution to this crisis we find ourselves in, 
What's not well known is that neoclassical economics, uh, which is still the theory upon which we run the world, whether we have a more neoliberal, conservative, free market orientation, or a more democratic, socialist, you know, government, uh, heavier government involvement version of, of economy. Um, all of these are built on neoclassical economics theory. And the foundation of neoclassical economics is Newtonian physics and a set of patently false assumptions that the early neoclassical economists use to apply Newtonian physics laws to a theory of economics. And on top of that, we layered over statistical methods to address uncertainty that are not compatible with the nature of complexity. Um, and, and, and the field of economics sits isolated from the real sciences of of physics, which is now quantum physics, of chemistry, including the geochemical systems and processes that, that govern our, our planet, uh, and biology, and specifically ecology, which of course shares the same Greek root as economy. So one could say that the theory we use to run the global economy, now the dominant operating system for all of humanity, is ignorant. In fact, you could say it's bankrupt. How else could a Nobel Prize, and by the way, the Nobel Prize in economics is actually not a genuine Nobel Prize because Mr. Nobel understood that science or that uh, economics was not actually a science. So there's a, there's a prize uh, created by the Swedish Central Bank in honor of Alfred Nobel, but it's, it's considered a Nobel Prize, certainly within the field. And my question is how else could a Nobel Prize be awarded to an academic, in, an economist in 2018, 2018 is not that long ago, whose work on climate change suggested that the optimal target for global warming was three and a half degrees Celsius, because anything lower would cost too much. And that furthermore, he said that um, uh, global warming wouldn't impact manufacturing that much because manufacturing happens indoors. I mean, it's, it's literally stunning to think that, that that type of thinking, that ignorance was awarded the highest prize uh, in economics. So I'd like to refer now to um, one of the sentences in Laudato Si. And I think this is the call um, uh, that we need to heed at this moment. Uh, Pope Francis wrote, we urgently need a humanism capable of bringing together the different fields of knowledge. Again, I think it was Doris talking about transdisciplinary conversations. Um, uh, we need a, again, we need a humanism capable of bringing together the different fields of knowledge, including economics, in the service of a more integral and integrating vision. Now, when I read Laudato Si, um, I literally started crying because um, I had put out this working paper or booklet literally a month earlier. And, um, and I went through reading Laudato Si and underlining the sentences and the, and this, you know, the paragraphs that related to the eight principles of uh, regenerative economics of living systems that, um, uh, that describe how um, uh, a regenerative economy needed to be uh, grounded. And so my, my work um, and my, 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 the work that I'm promoting is um, uh, highly aligned with Laudato Si in a way that um, uh, really made me uh, quite emotional. And um, so, so for me, the response to that call from Pope Francis is that um, uh, we need an economics uh, that, that for lack of a different term, I'm calling regenerative economics. And regenerative is an important word. It's literally the process of how uh, living systems work. If, they, if, if our bodies were not regenerating as we're having this conversation, we wouldn't be able to have this conversation. So how do we reintegrate uh, beauty into our economics and think of economics as both science and art? And I would suggest, of course, life is beautiful. Nature is beautiful as Mary Evelyn beautifully described. And I'm fortunate to live not too far down the road on Long Island Sound and, and Fisher's Island Sound. And, and the Atlantic Ocean from where she described. And life is the result of this regenerative process. 
And we can describe this regenerative process, not with laws, the way we describe physical laws, but with patterns and principles. Um, think of them as first principles. So imagine if we choose to begin reconstructing our economics on the foundation of these first principles and on the foundation of these patterns that exist in all life. This is the promise of regenerative economics. Now, why is this so hard to do? I would suggest it's that we are addicted to success, to growth, to wealth and power, to fame, all derived from our extractive system. But like all addictions, what we truly yearn for is to dampen the fear and the pain of our lower consciousness energy and awaken to a higher consciousness. Again, consistent with what uh, Doris and Mary Evelyn have already spoken about. So the key here is that we yearn for a spiritual spark to make meaning of our lives. And so the challenge of rethinking economics is at its core, a spiritual challenge. Thank you, and look forward to the conversation. Thank you, John Fullerton, uh, for joining us and for uh, highlighting especially the, that we need to understand the economic system also as a complex system. And also, unfortunately, how the economic theory is far behind the, this understanding, understanding phenomena like uh, climate change and uh, many others in a complex way. So your proposal of regenerative economics seems very interesting uh, in, in, on this path. Uh, also, thanks for sharing uh, your impressions about Laudato Si. I think that uh, here in this group, you have many people closely related to, to Laudato Si. Uh, I changed my uh, career uh, because of it. Uh, I decided to work with climate change and, and economics after reading Laudato Si in the beginning of my master. And I think that other people here also have a close, uh, close um, relationship with uh, this encyclica. Well, now uh, we will open uh, for you in the audience for question to our speakers. We will have a small question and answer uh, section. I would like to invite you. Okay, we have already Patrick, but also if you want, if you feel uh, comfortable to speak, open your microphone in your camera and raise your hands on reactions. So we will call you. If you don't feel uh, comfortable, you can write on the chat and I can read for the speakers. So please, Patrick, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, so thanks a lot to uh, all of the speakers. Absolutely terrific. Um, that's, that's uh, yeah, just brilliant. At that stage, I might actually um, also announce as kind of part of the organizing team that um, I will be writing a book based on the uh, three questions that came out of from, from the Pope, so it's with the German publisher, which is kind of like the biggest German progressive publisher, um, Westen Verlag, it came out of a discussion. So um, yeah, it's not just that kind of the essay that we write, but it's uh, it has a lot of multipliers, um, so to say. And um, I would like to address, um, well, actually two questions to John. Um, the first one being, um, you said that uh, uselessness doesn't play any role um, in our economic system, which was my first thought when I read that question too. But then when you mentioned, you know, you've been working in finance and so on and so forth, one thought that I had was, um, doesn't uselessness actually play a really big role in finance if we think about how useless actually a lot of the kind of like financial like financialized capitalism actually <laughs> is. So um, I would like to hear your thoughts on that. And then secondly, um, because you touched upon a few points which I wrote down also for my book. So I was just wondering if at some point um, towards the end of the year maybe or so we could just have a little conversation about some of the themes that I want to outline. So that's the second question. Um, it, would be, it would be great if, if I could have your thoughts on that. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I was just laughing so hard about your first comment. I, I missed the second question. Well, it was basically just a request whether um, you might be able to find some, I don't know, half an hour, hour um, in your schedule at some point. This oh, day, yeah, yeah. Some of the well, themes that you raise more in depth because it's relevant to me, but I'm not sure that it's that relevant to, to, to the audience. Well, that, that, that's easy. The answer to that is yes. And um, 
And in response to your first question, it's, uh, it reminds me of a, a famous statement that Paul Volcker made, the former and, and deceased, but, but ch uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve. Uh, I think he said this after the financial crisis where he said the, the last significant, meaningful and useful innovation that come out of Wall Street was the, um, the cash machine. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, you know it, it's a provocative statement though, and, and really um, at the heart of my work, um, it's not just that there is a lot of useless activity in our financial system, but there's actually a tremendous amount of toxic and destructive activity. And I'm actually not even talking about the the the, the reckless greed and and irresponsible um, uh, behavior. Um, we we have somehow confused means and ends, and think that the the day to day activity of the global capital markets is like ordained by God and needs to be the way it is. And we don't have the courage to question um, uh, what has become essentially the you know, the means, um, the con a confusion of means and ends. And, and I'll just use that as a quick example of why I think it's so critical to get clear on first principles. Um, one principle in living systems is um, uh, this idea of right relationship or symbiosis or mutualism. And um, if you think about the global capital markets, we've disintermediated, uh, we've separated the relationship between what we call owners, they're not owners, they're just shareholders who own a security and, and, and global enterprises. And so we, we don't have, not only do we not have a right relationship in the sense of the, the Quaker meaning of that term, but we don't even have any relationship. And so, um, but we think of that as normal and we think of secondary trading as a business. And so we have this massive casino that has all kinds of destructive consequences. And we think we're gonna change that by creating more transparency about environmental, social and governance metrics in companies when in fact, we need to reconnect ownership and the responsibility as, as Professor Summer talked about that comes with ownership. We need to reconnect that with enterprise. And, and you only see that issue if you get first clear on first principles of how living systems actually work. So it's a long answer to a very punchy comment you made, Patrick. Thanks, John. Uh, before uh, calling Jay, I'd like to open uh, to the other speakers. If you want to make any comment about the question, feel free. If not, we call Jay for the next question. No, okay. So Jay, please, the floor is yours. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for this uh, great contribution to this webinar series and I think to what is actually required for us to uh, start the conversation about why we're here uh, as, uh, as young scholars, as, as human beings, and what our contribution is to, to this planet, because I think there's so many concerns that we are, we're grappling with uh, and I think uh, a lot of us are searching for the right footing to it as uh, my bunny rabbits have bitten through my internet cable. So I'm in a very weak hotspot at the moment. Um, so uh, I hope you can still hear me. So I want to maybe uh, start the question uh, and, and maybe a ref quick reflection um, uh, on the following point. Um, John, you said something that struck me, which is to start with the first principles and try to reframe them. But I think this might be in slight contradiction with what Doris said, which is we have to start with experience first and concepts come later. So I'm wondering, um, so this is uh, just the way we also think about it in YSI to some degree, like uh, can we solve a rational paradigm with more rationality? Uh, that's my question first. Like this is something where we have taken uh, to some extreme, uh, the rationality we currently have with big tech just taking this question further and further and data science now emerging with big data and all these, these phenomena and now are sort of taking these two extremes and we're trying to find meaning and, and like more, and I think we're just becoming more entrapped in the same sort of dynamics of these rational 
these rational dynamics if you want to keep it at that level. And I think um, what, what you're hinting at is actually an interplay between rationality and, um, and emotional intelligence or emotional experience, uh, the, the spiritual uh, that we've all been alluding to. So I'm wondering um, how we can actually, um, I think it, the stories that were told today uh, by all, all of the speakers, I was really struck. This was a, really, a real highlight to my, to my week, maybe even to my year so far, to hear all the, your, the way you expressed it. And I think I've been hearing art and other arts, uh, forms of expression um, to be allowed and encouraged. Um, this brings me back to what actually Rob always does and what, where Einitz, uh, I think from the very beginning was actually trying to allow for more forms of expression to be uh, not just at our disposal, but actively encouraged. The first, the first thing that I experienced when I walked into an INET conference in 2012, which was also the inception of, of, of the Young Scholars Initiative, was a bunch of art. There was, uh, there were, there was an art exhibition, there were collaborations. Um, uh, there was an, an artist uh, in the room interacting with, with, the, with the participants and this stimulated all the senses. This, uh, this was the aesthetic that we, was mentioned earlier as well. And I think we have to, uh, with, without, without even specifying it, this was a leading by example. This was leading with experience of how people are brought together, how the senses stay fresh to the problems and not become desensitized. So I'm, I'm trying to just an offer and a reflection, maybe um, a way of how, how do we actually bring this sentiment that was expressed in this exact, uh, in this conversation back to the community to, and actually into an everyday experience that we want to bring back to the education to how people do their work on a, in a, in an everyday level. This has to be a centeredness that we have to have in everything we do um, because this is, how we are connected to the problems. Um, so I guess my, my provocation, my question is to all of the speakers to sort of say, where, how do we actually build exactly the sensitivity that you have now acquired in your life and offer this opportunity to, to start uh, a young career with these experiences, with this, with this groundedness um, that all of us in Young Scholars are actually intuitively searching uh, many, many people are searching. I think a lot of us are lost. But we're actually, there's, there's the emergence of yoga and Eastern philosophy and all these other things are sort of a, a trend, but I think we're not yet fully there to sort of at the foundations, as John was saying, as, uh, rethink our first principles. It's sort of a, it's top, it's on top of it. It's not really rethinking the foundations. So I think um, these are reflections, not a direct question, but I'm trying to sort of advance the conversation for us to sort of see how we can uh, be in this between the inductive uh, and the, the rational. How does this actually work? We might, uh, the danger that I'm seeing or what I'm, that I'm, 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 I'm also encountering is that we might not be taken seriously with uh, in the curse of current paradigm by separating uh, with the current institutions that value only certain types of knowledge and certain types of, uh, certain types of approaches. Uh, if you can articulate this in a rational way that this is, a, this is a, an intuitive way. So I'm, I'm struggling a little bit about how this shifts the narrative if we can't get a collective experience to shift it uh, for everyone. Um, so yeah, I'll leave it at that, but I want to just say thank you. And I'm looking forward to your reflections on, on this sort of uh, longer thought that I had about uh, all of your contributions. If I may, I'd like to uh, start. Yes. Um, thank you so much for the reflection, Jay. Uh, you bring up for me, the difference between first principles and reason. Uh, what Kant did in his third critique was rescue judgment from reason. His first two books were about reason, scientific reason, which he called uh, pure reason, and social reason, uh, which he called practical reason, right? And everyone thought he was done. But he, as an old man, and then they told him, oh, you're senile, you don't know what you're talking about anymore. As an old man, he said, there's an important piece that we've left out, and that is judgment. Judgment is a faculty, it's not a principle. It's a muscle that we have allowed to atrophy. And so when John picked up that um, artists allow themselves to float a bit, it's because we don't have 
a principle yet. We don't have a concept yet. And we allow our experience and our conversations with other people to co-construct that concept. But even to do that, the faculty is collaborative. It's imagination. It's the Spieltrieb. So Kant begins from faculties and not from principle. And I think that's his major contribution that we leave out when we think that the enlightenment is only about reason. So I, you know, I'm a professor. I could talk for longer, but I'll stop. <laughs> um, I might jump in and then John, you can wind it up. Uh, so yes, very, very thoughtful. Thank you, um, Jay. So as a humanist, as a student of world religions for 10 years in graduate school with some of the best scholars at Columbia and elsewhere, um, and as someone deeply devoted to the humanities and literature and the arts and drama and so on, but as someone who's worked within secular academia my whole life, um, you know, including doing conferences at Harvard on the world's religions, being at Yale at the School of the Environment. Uh, you know, I think this is a hugely important issue. But you know what I love about Rob and his beginning is um, the daring and creativity. I mean, there was, I, I don't mean to be too self-referential here, but I want to be encouraging in this way. There was no field of religion and ecology 25 years ago. And to do three years of conferences at Harvard was brutal. <laughs> brutal. And the scientists don't fully understand it still, but all religions are based in the great cycles of nature. And that's what gives inspiration. Or you take Tai Chi or Qigong and they're reflecting the movements of the natural world. Yoga positions do as well. And we have become de-removed <laughs> from all of these dynamics of nature. That's what I was trying to say. And you know, there's books now on this, there's, there's practices on it. But the other part, so what I'm saying is <laughs> courage, maybe a partner who you love and can do this with. John Grimm is fantastic. His specialty is indigenous traditions. We've had enormous experiences all over the world. And the revival of indigenous ways of knowing is one of the most hopeful signs we have. Traditional environmental knowledge is now being integrated to scientific knowledge for regeneration of fisheries, of forests, of all kinds of things. The regeneration of culture in Hawaii with the Hokulea navigational techniques is non parallel and all through the Pacific region, what that has created. Um, check it out, Hokulea. Um, and they did this with indigenous knowledge. So that is, um, extraordinary. The rights of nature, of, of rivers and things like uh, in New Zealand. But I wanted to just underscore what I was also trying to say with, with this journey of the universe. Thomas Berry said in 1978, we need a new story that brings us together because story ignites our imagination and sparks our dreams. And the dream that we have been living with is the American dream, which from my view has gone mad, has, has gone astray, because it's all about materialism more and more bigger and better. So from materialism, we've lost, why does matter matter? Why does this complexification with greater consciousness and sentience in the process, but that sentience is distributed throughout with animals and plants and so on. Why have we lost sight of that with such a materialist worldview? Because the dream drives the action, but that dream is unraveling. And why do we now have some of the best work in animal behavior talking about communication, consciousness, songs of whales, et cetera? And why do we have this explosion of work on forests and roots communicating? We did three seminars here at Yale on forests and the new knowledge about forests. Over a thousand people signed up for each one of them. Yale has never seen a webinar like that, okay? Because that kind of knowledge is penetrating the ivory towered walls and silos. Why? 
because your generation understands it, gets it, can be flexible, can be nimble. And if you are brave and you do fusion of knowledge, you can do this because the older generation is all nervous still about their grants and their CVs and so on. But this is penetrating, I can say. It's absolutely penetrating. So trust your intuition that this is a living, regenerative Earth systems. And once we embrace that, um, and it's, it's, this is the best of science, the best of indigenous traditions, symbiosis of Lynn Margulis and James Lovelock with the Gaia hypothesis. Lynn Margulis was rejected for symbiosis. And now that is absolutely embraced. So sorry to go on for a long time, but pragmatism is what drives Americans. <laughs> And principles are left so far behind, but pragmatism leads to burnout and to a lack of this deep spiritual grounding that we're talking about. Principles will be the regenerative sensibility of how we're aligned with these processes. And that's the great extraordinary power of what Pope Francis is also offering. Um, so, Sorry to go on at some length, but <laughs> your question uh, provoked all of that. Um, I'm tempted not to add to it, but I don't see another hand. So I'll jump in re really briefly. Uh, Jay, again, thank you for that. Um, I agree with you. The, this is not an intellectual exercise. And I, in the short time that I shared my story, I, you know, I did refer to a 10 year hiatus. It literally was 10 years. And it was very painful, um, and and I felt very lost. And um, and my pathway to this idea came through a synchronicity. Um, speaking of the universe, speaking, um, uh, I had written a my first kind of coming out of the closet paper uh, to try to make sense of this. I wrote a paper called "The Relevance of Schumacher in the 21st Century." And someone sent it to a guy called Alan Savory sitting in Zimbabwe. And he sent me an email saying he saw a, you know, finance person who seemed to understand holistic thinking. And Alan Savory introduced me to what he calls holistic plan grazing, which we don't need to get into, but it's essentially biomimicry applied to the large landscapes of grasslands. And I learned through that experience, I actually invested in a company. We created a company together to put this idea into practice. And so I learned by doing and experienced that. And then my imagination said, well, if this holistic thinking can work on a system called a ranch and a ranch is a living system, and if the economy is a living system, then why can't this same approach be extended and applied to the entire global economy. And, and that, was, um, that was a crazy idea, but that's where it was rooted. It wasn't rooted because I went to study something called regenerative economics at Yale or Harvard or anywhere else, it didn't exist. Um, so the other comment I would say about, you know, experiential learning and storytelling, if you go to our website, we've documented 50 stories uh, of what we see as the emergent regenerative economy. Most of them are small grassrootsy kind of things. But the cool thing is that once you see the world through this regenerative lens, you see the regenerative economy everywhere, emergent. Um, you know, a farmer's market is the regenerative economy. It's just that we call it a quaint little farmer's market, but that's the regenerative economy. And um, so for, for young people who feel lost, um, you know, my, my, um, my advice to you, not advice, my, my encouragement to you is to understand that, you know, we're in an epical change between the modern age and what many are calling the integral age. I'll go out on the limb and call it the regenerative age, because I don't think we get to the integral age if we don't pass through the regenerative age. But it's meant to feel uncomfortable. Of course, it's uncomfortable. But um, my own experience was to, you know, um, trust my instinct. You know, my instinct is what caused me to leave Morgan. And, and, and I believe all of our instincts are calling us in this right direction. And um, we just have to have the courage to listen to them as opposed to 
default to the logical part of our brain saying, I need to do this because I need to be successful or I need to make a living or I need to do this. And I'm not belittling it uh, at all. I have three kids who are right in the thick of this challenge uh, myself, but um, I would just encourage us all to, um, uh, to, to get comfortable in the discomfort um, because that's the moment that we happen to live in.